I've been looking forward to this day for quite some time to be able to come and speak to everybody, but not so much that as to come and hear all these other faithful brethren present these uh, good gospel messages. I was uh, really impressed with Ryan. I love Ryan, and I think sometimes we forget uh, some of these young men and just how good a job they're doing. And uh, I appreciate the lesson that he presented, and I have uh, 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 so many things, so many good feelings about Ryan and his faithfulness, and it restores maybe a, a it restores our confidence in the young preachers of the gospel when we hear so many people talking about how so, so many are wandering away. And then we hear people like Ryan and others, and it says what you're doing here is well worth the time and the, the effort, the money and all that uh, goes into it. So I was very impressed with that uh, lesson and I uh, want, want to say that publicly. I was talking to Denver a few minutes ago, or a couple hours ago actually, and uh, uh, that's on the other end of the thing, I guess, <laughs> uh, from young to old, but, <laughs> but uh, which is why I'll never be asked to speak here again. This is, what, <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that gets me in trouble. But. I asked Denver, I said, Denver, I want you to think about doing me a favor. I said, I wish you'd preach my funeral. And he kind of reared back just like he's, I don't know, he never did give me an answer. So <laughs> he might, I'll tell you the way I've been feeling lately, he might be doing that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I appreciate all of you and uh, the opportunity, of course, to be here. And there was some talk that uh, Dan might introduce me, my best friend, Dan Kessinger. I'm so thankful that that, that didn't happen. <laughs> Because he always tells these crazy stories about me, uh, some of which are true, <laughs> most of which are not true. I'm going to tell one quick one on Dan before we get to the subject of our hour. Because he didn't introduce me, but I'm going to tell you some things. And I, I believe you me, if the occasion was different, I could tell you a lot of things about Dan. And you, I was holding a meeting down at the Main Street Church of Christ in Hurricane, West Virginia, and a couple of the older men were talking to me there. And one of them said, uh, uh, the way you preach, I, I bet you're connected with the school preaching up there. Was Dan Kessinger your instructor? <laughs> of course, we're the same age. I'm actually a little older than Dan. So I reared back and told a lie. <laughs> I said, yes, yes, he was my instructor. <laughs> but actually, I, afterwards, I did uh, try to straighten that out because I didn't want to be stricken dead. So. I did tell them, no, he, we were actually, I said, believe it or not, I'm actually older than he is. Oh, really? So, anyway, I guess it's not the years, it's the miles, huh, Dan? <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. The uh, text that was assigned to me for our lesson this afternoon. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. I love uh, the assigned passage that they gave me. It addresses a number of issues that I think we must look at, and that we, we learn about the church in its infancy and what they were facing. Ryan had mentioned earlier that the incident with Ananias and Sapphira was uh, an example of how Satan would attack 
The same commentary that made the comments that he quoted goes on to reference chapter 6 here as again another attack, a way to disrupt the work of God and the growth of the kingdom of God. The sad reality is that growth and trouble often go hand in hand. We are kidding ourselves if we think Satan will sit idly by and allow the Lord's church to prosper. He will not do so. Satan will attack. In my experience, in the years that I've been preaching the gospel, I've noticed it many times that when things are going well, that's when you need to brace yourself and look out because Satan will come in whatever door he can come in and do anything that he can to disrupt the work of the people of God. So it was with the Jerusalem church. Uh, they were growing. The gospel was being preached. They saw the need for daily ministering to the needs of certain folks. And uh, some commentaries point out that this was certainly uh, probably a carryover of the Jewish practice of the collection of food and money, I believe on Fridays, uh, that would be distributed to the needy. They also had a daily ministration for those who were in dire straits, and so they would take care of the needs on a daily basis. And it's, it's very likely that the church incorporated it uh, into their practice, uh, which, of course, is a biblical concept. And I think, again, Ryan made a couple references, references to that. In Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, uh, Luke records this, And all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. It appears that what was taking place in our text was that those who were the local Jews, if I can say it that way, were neglecting those who had traveled from distances, who were the ones who, in some cases, didn't even really know the Hebrew language. And so it appears that, that they were kind of being snobbish toward those who came from other areas. And so again, you see Satan's hand in this. It's also interesting to notice that the first problem in the first Church of Christ, incidentally, was over temporal things, not over doctrinal things. It's, it's clear to me that Satan will use anything to destroy the local work in any body of Christ. Well, what's interesting is it seems as though the uh, Grecian Christians had, uh, they were going to the apostles with this problem. They probably thought that the apostles would drop everything. We've got a problem here. We, uh, our uh, widows are being neglected. We have folks who need things and they're not getting the things that they need. The response is probably, even though they were pleased when they heard the full response and understood it, probably at first um, we may assume that they weren't pleased as we find they were later. We might assume that because my problems are the biggest problems in my life. And we think very selfishly. And they probably thought that the disciples ought, or the apostles rather ought to stop preaching the gospel and working as they were to uh, take the, the gospel and carry out the Great Commission as I think we noticed in one of the lessons that uh, to go to Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world and stop that and take care of this uh, uh, lesser matter, if you will. Their answer is interesting. The King James says, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not logical that we leave preaching the gospel and get involved in serving tables, which certainly had reference to, this, uh, uh, to meeting these physical needs. So there we have an answer. Which is more important? Feeding the needy or preaching the gospel? Neither should be neglected as works of the church. But the most important thing that we can do is to preach the gospel. And I think they really set this forth here. The apostles knew the commitment that they had made and, and uh, uh, they wanted to continue in prayer and as it says in verse 4, to, uh, in the ministry of the word. 
It's interesting to notice, and, and some maybe have, have made a bigger deal of this than I'm willing to at, at, on this occasion, that the words ministration, ministry, and serve in Acts chapter 6 all come from the same Greek word of which one form ends up being deacon. The conclusion being that some commentaries, if not many, believe that this was the appointment of seven deacons, that they were actually appointed to a literal continual office. Time won't allow us to address that this afternoon. If, we, if you want to talk about that, we can maybe talk about that on another occasion. But I'm convinced that this was a temporary appointment for, as it says in verse 3, in the end of the verse, in the King James, to point over this business. I think they were given a specific appointment to answer a problem and weren't given a, a deaconship, if you will, as some would advocate. Now, if somebody wants to make another conclusion, that's fine. Uh, in the seeming absence of elders, I'm not uh, fully convinced this is the case either, that they were appointing deacons. Be that as it may, they served this work. It pleased the brethren that they were willing to do this. And so we see two basic points in our lesson that we're going to talk about for the remainder of this lesson. And that is, this text shows us how important it is to minister to physical needs, that we should not neglect that. And we'll talk about that for a few moments. And then how much more important it is to minister to spiritual needs. Let's talk about, number one, ministering to physical needs. We have to take care of physical needs. I understand that concept. I understand what James said in James chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself or himself unspotted from the world. We understand that word visit, uh, the idea that we're to communicate, to, to help, to be benevolent uh, in these situations. We have biblical authority to do that and we need to do it. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 that was cited in one of the other lectures says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I use that as a, a text that will, I believe, prove that the church has biblical authority both to help our own members and to help those who are from without. And I absolutely hold to that position. And so as we talk about the lesser of these two ministerings, if you will, some have concluded that we should avoid helping those physically, from a physical standpoint, only our own brethren. Some have parceled out scriptures that, that do not merit parsing, and, uh, and I didn't say that right, <laughs> that do not merit being uh, divided, and they will say, well, we should be very careful that we take money out of our own pocket and help somebody, but then we could not use it from the treasury. It's absolutely unfounded. The simple fact is the church has a duty to minister to physical needs, to help those who are within and those who are without. What do we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13? Uh, Paul talks about the generosity of the Corinthian brethren, and he says this, in supporting the uh, Jerusalem, or the Jerusalem brethren rather, uh, he commended them for, as he says, liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. You can't get away from that. This is a duty that the church has. We should not, 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, see our brother in need and shut up our bowels of compassion from him. We need to help those who are around us, do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of faith. That makes sense, and all you have to do is look at it from a common sense standpoint, and it makes sense. When we try to go out and talk to people in the, in the world, and we try to describe a concept that says, we cannot help you because we're the church of Christ and the Lord has restricted us from helping you, it doesn't fit into the context of anything we know about the nature of the gospel of Christ. Jesus feeding the 5,000. I think I said this in another lecture down at uh, where Dan preaches, but Jesus saying to the 5,000, well, you sort out the good Jews and the bad ones. We'll feed the good ones and we'll not feed anybody else. It's ridiculous. 
It defies the nature of the Lord's church. We need to be concerned about ministering in terms of physical needs. Let me say this, though. We do not want to make ourselves a target. There's a right way and a wrong way to handle these types of things. I can recite many stories to you about things that have happened over the years that show the situations we can get ourselves in at times. One time I was preaching in Hanoverton, Ohio. I was up there about 10 years up in uh, Hanoverton. And a man came by and he requested money. And I said, well, what's the problem? You know, in other words, why do you need the money? And he said, I need the money because I don't have a job. I cannot get a job. Well, I had just been told by some of the men that worked on the birch farm, they need people right now. Bob knows about that. We need people today to help us get these crops in, to get this hay in. We'll pay them such and such an amount an hour. And I told him, I said, I can help you, being maybe young and naive. I said, I can help you. But rather than giving you a handout, I will see that you get a job. You can start. I'll take you up there. And there was even some arrangements uh, they were trying to make to give this man a place to stay. He said, well, how much are they paying? And I told him, he said, I'm not working for that much money. And I, I told somebody, this is almost absolutely true. I turned for a moment and looked, and he was gone. <laughs> I don't know how he got the car started and got out of there so quickly, but I looked, and it was like he disappeared and vanished. Well, we run into those things. We need to be careful and try to evaluate as much as we possibly can whether these situations are legitimate, but we're still obligated. This is one of the two key points I see here in Acts chapter 6, and that is there is a need for ministration of physical needs. People have needs. We should help people that are truly in need, and I think that's legitimate. Now, for uh, about six or seven years, I preached at Langs, Ohio. Many of you may know where that is, and the house was not located near the, the uh, church building, and somehow somebody got uh, our address, and an old rickety car pulled into my driveway one day, and a fellow got out of the car, and he said, uh, we need some money. And I, I, of course, I could tell that uh, by the car. Of course, the funny thing is, Dan, at that time, my car wasn't much better. <laughs> I said, join the club, buddy. <laughs> but he said, I need money, and I said, well... Uh, what's the situation? And as we try to find out, of course, what's going on. And, and he said, uh, well, we're traveling from Cleveland to Florida, and we were passing through this area and just happened to hear your name. I'm thinking, wait a minute. If any of you all ever been up to Langs, you don't pass from Cleveland to Florida by Langs. It's not possible. And so uh, what was interesting is, he did have children and, and a wife, and I said, uh, really, right now, we don't have a policy about handing out cash, as it, as it were, but I said, we, just had, we had just taken up uh, a collection, not of money, but of various household items because of the flood that had taken place over uh, near Marlington, you remember, several years ago, and uh, I just happened to have some supplies, and I said, I can give you some supplies and some food for the children and diapers and such as that, and... He took those things, but uh, sometimes these stories uh, don't really add up. So we need to be very careful that we're good stewards as brethren and that we don't become foolish. One of the other things that happened that uh, reminds me of this uh, point, and this one plays on our pride, because the, uh, when I was up at Hanoverton, I received a call one day, and the fellow said, well, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and named, named himself, and he said, I'm uh, in Texas. But he said, a few weeks ago, I stopped in and visited the congregation there. And, of course, you know, the wheels are spinning. I'm trying to think, well, who was it? I don't know if I remember. And, I'm, I, you know, you're ashamed to admit you didn't remember, so you're trying to, you know, think of who the fellow was, and you're on the spot. And he said, we were up there because we were getting ready to uh, move in the area, and we've come back down here to Texas to load our stuff up, but we, we've run out of money. We can't make it back up there. And I believe we made a terrible mistake with good hearts. We uh, wired him $200. You know the rest of the story. We never heard from the man again. It happens. Now that doesn't take away from the fact that we do need, as we find opportunity, 
to do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of faith. We need to be involved in helping people. And we need to even look among our brethren. Times are hard. Where I preach, we've had one family that lost their home. We've had people lose jobs. Times are hard. We need to assist and help one another, especially those of the household of faith. The work they wanted to do here then was a good and godly work to help those that were in need, those that were being neglected, uh, namely these uh, widows that were being neglected. They needed help. And so they came up with the answer. We need to minister in terms of these physical things. And that leads me to the second point and that is, we find in this passage, the ministry of the word. I want you to consider this. As I mentioned earlier, the apostles said it's not reason, it's not logical, it's not reasonable that we should leave the word of God, leave this ministry, uh, uh, leave this effort to serve tables, to take care of these uh, temporal things. Find people that can do that. Let them take care of it so we can get back to what God has set forth for us to do. Now, I want to skip all the way down to verse 7. And I want you to notice something. The result of what took place here, the proper handling of a problem. There are many things that happened here, but there was a proper handling of a problem. Look at the result. De the devil did get his way here. By the way, neither did he get his way in Acts chapter 5. But he didn't get his way here. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And the company, company of the priests were obedient. A great company, rather, the priests were obedient to the faith. Why? Because they let preachers preach. That's what congregations must do. I will not say this is the only point. Maybe I could not necessarily prove that this is the most powerful point of what we find here, but I believe it is a strong point that we find here. Churches need to let preachers preach the gospel. Preachers are not celebrities. Preachers are not socialites. One congregation that I was aware of had a job description that their preacher was obligated to go down to McDonald's and sit in the morning and drink coffee. I said, why don't I find congregations like that? <laughs> but they, their obligation was that their preacher would go down and sit, and they thought that was an evangelistic tool because, you know, there would be a group of older men that would go down there and drink coffee, and they could, you know, that just seems a little odd to me to be such a strong requirement. The preacher's goal should never be to win friends and influence people, but to win people to Christ. My job, as I see it, as a gospel preacher, is not to make my congregation feel good about themselves but to make them feel good about doing what is right in the sight of God. We don't need in the Church of Christ Joel Osteen type preaching. It does no good. Consider the prophets in the Old Testament. We've been studying in Amos, we've been studying the Minor Prophets, and we've been studying uh, the book of Amos. You know, Amos said, I'm not a prophet or son of a prophet, and I always call him a, a kind of the country farmer prophet. Very plain spoken, as all the prophets were. He just simply took the message. He didn't even think about the repercussions. He took the message and said, Thus saith the Lord. And then the people had to deal with that. Amos is humorous to me because of some of the things that he says. He talks, for example, in chapter 6 about uh, uh, the uh, Israelites. They were living in a time of prosperity and they were on their beds of ivory and, and inventing to themselves stringed instruments like David. They were living in a lap of luxury. My favorite 
prophetic insult, Dan probably knows where I'm going with this, is Amos chapter 4 and verse 1 where he calls the Israelite women cows. That doesn't sound very nice. And he's kind of, in a sense, saying you're uh, fatted cows uh, being set up for the slaughter. Look at the nature of these prophets. Our gospel preachers, even these young ones, need to study, and I know they will here, study these prophets. These were not men that, that coddled people along. They just preached the truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, or 4 and verse 2, rather. Sorry about that. Preach the word, be instant in season, and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Certainly the times in which we live tell us, they speak to us, and they say, we need faithful, fearless, courageous gospel preachers, preachers not compromisers. Back to Amos, Amos chapter 5 and verse 13. Therefore the prudent shall keep silent in that time, for it is an evil time. Well, I've heard quite a few explanations of that passage, and I may have that wrong. But my take on that is, the implication is, times are bad and people are not prone. It just seems, you know, we want to be very careful what we say. Amos wasn't too worried about that. He spoke the word of God plainly. I was given a quote, actually an entire article, some time ago by Jim Farley, and I told him that I would use it uh, in part uh, in this lecture from Dillard Thurman. And the title of the article was, Give Us Fearless Preachers. And he wrote, I am confident that no generation preceding this one has had a greater need for uncompromising, fearless, and straightforward preaching and preachers. There is such moral and spiritual decay in our society that the pressures of, on any preacher, rather, of the gospel is constant and oppressing. You know when he wrote that article? In 1964. And I suggest to you if it was true then, which it was true, it certainly true today. Consider Paul's powerful statement in Romans chapter 1 verses 14 to 17. He says there are three ideas conveyed here I believe about and he expresses them about preaching. In Romans chapter 1 verses 14 to 17 you can pick out these expressions. He said I am debtor, I am ready, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now look at these. He said I am debtor. One who preaches the gospel must see the obligation of preaching and teaching the gospel. They must see that need. Paul said, I am debtor. He said, I am ready. He was kind of like we used to say, raring to go. He was ready to go and to, to preach the gospel wherever it was needed. There burns in my heart a fire to want to preach. I love preaching. I love preaching the gospel. I love those who preach the gospel. I start to say from the oldest to the youngest. <laughs> I love everybody that preaches the gospel faithfully. They'll have no closer friend or closer ally than myself because I, I, I love that. It burns within me. I saw that in Dan when we were in school. Oddly enough, I often tell this, but I think when we were in college, Dan started out as like a business major. I thought, what a waste of a good mind and a, and a, and a good person. But you can tell. You can tell the difference in one who is ready one who's interested, one who has a burning desire to preach the gospel, and one who's just going through the, mo the emotions. Preaching really takes a beating in our modern society, our modern culture. Preachers are typically viewed as losers, the poor sucker in town, uh, the one that can't do anything else. You might end up with a student or two 
that that's the very reason they were sent here, and I think that's tragic. A preacher must see the obligation. I'm a debtor. I am ready. And then I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's the commitment you must make. I won't speak down to young preachers. It hadn't been too long ago, I guess, that I was a younger preacher. Incidentally, somebody made a comment about my picture in the book. They said, what's that, your high school picture? And I told them that, that picture was taken about 20 or 25 pounds ago. <laughs> so it wasn't taken that long ago, about seven years, I guess. But uh, anyway, I was young at one time. So I don't talk down to these young gospel preachers. I'm proud of them. But we need to have the proper view about preaching the gospel. Congregations need to allow their preachers to preach. Preachers need to be, realize the concept of the obligation. I'm a debtor. I'm ready. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And congregations sometimes weigh down their ministers. I've been there. I know about that. And they weigh down their, 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 these congregations weigh these ministers down with other types of jobs under the heading of serving tables. And so the preacher becomes a chauffeur, becomes again, as I said earlier, a socialite. I don't mind taking some dear sister to the doctor that needs to go, but sometimes other people can do things. If you promise me you won't send a copy of this, John, back to the uh, one lady that I mentioned in our congregation, a very sweet lady, I'll say this before this audience. Somehow it'll come back to haunt me, but several weeks ago or several months ago, she came to me and uh, she said, uh, you made some mistakes here in the bulletin, and, and she's a sweet lady, but she does notice the mistakes. <laughs> you know what I told her? I said, you're right. I stink at this, so start next Sunday, you can do it. John can tell you, she has absolutely, her, she and her sister, they have done a tremendous job. I don't have to do all these th types of things. Churches need to let their preachers preach. And they need to allow them some time to study to preach. We forget that in all the, the busyness of, of whatever it means to run a local congregation. Let me ask you a question. Think back to your last business meeting, wherever you come from. What did you talk about? The fact is that if I were a betting man, I would bet, and I'm not. <laughs> but if I was, I would say you spent most of your time talking about who, what car are we going to paint the wall and what are we going to do about that crack over in the and that leak in the ceiling, and, and the plumbing's bad, and we, we can't get the commodes to flush, and all those, don't we do that? We, we concentrate on the temporal things, and forget the spiritual. For, the, for that very fact, if not for other issues as well, it tends to have an effect on how we view what a preacher should do, the work of a minister. I heard... Um, Dan's dad say one time that he was in a congregation and uh, they expected him, uh, I can't remember all the details, but they expected him to be there for a big building cleanup one day and he said, you didn't hire me as a custodian. And that's right. And again, please do not misunderstand. Ministers should minister. Often that may involve temporal things, but our primary job as gospel preachers is to preach the gospel. Churches need to let preachers preach the gospel, and we need to be preaching the gospel. For the remainder of this lesson, for the next just couple of moments, there's a, there's a series of uh, qualifications for preachers, as Guy in Woods uh, labeled them, that I included in the book. We're not going to look at all of them. There's no time to do that. Uh, you can take the book and look at them. But when we talk about qualifications, people tend to think of elders and deacons as if a preacher has no real qualifications that are expected of him. Certainly, that is not the case. We find many of them 
course, throughout the New Testament, we find many of them in the book of Titus, where Paul expressed to Titus a number of things, and also, of course, to Timothy. Let me highlight just a couple for the sake of time. One is found in Titus chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, Rebuke false teachers sharply. That's not an exact quote, but that's the context. We need to stand up against the error that we sometimes encounter. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, to speak the things which become sound doctrine. That means, as is said on another occasion, the whole counsel of God. A preacher said, I'm sad to report to you, fairly recently, in reference to a topic, I cannot preach on that topic. I have too much at stake financially. The topic, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. That's sad. In my estimation, that man should not be preaching. Don't ask me who it was. It, it's, not, it, it, it's, a, it's my prayer that this will be corrected. I'm just making a point. Among that list, Titus 2 and verse 7, in all things show oneself a pattern of good works. In other words, being a good example. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20, those that sin rebuke before all. 1 Timothy 5 verse 20, I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 21, observe these things without preferring one another doing nothing with partiality. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 22, keep oneself pure. I cannot emphasize that enough. A preacher is expected to be pure. I didn't say perfect. I said pure. Preachers, with the exception of those who have certain degrees in counseling and are licensed are not counselors. We need to stop going around talking about counseling married couples when we don't have any qualification to do that. Please don't misunderstand me. I can advise anyone that wants to sit down and look at the Word of God in relation to their relationship. We should not wear that badge of being a counselor but if we do, if we're qualified to either sit down and advise one, which is as far as I go with that, I say, well, I'm not a counselor, but I'll advise you. I'll talk with you based on the scripture. I will not do that. In a disgruntled situation, a husband and wife are disgruntled and upset with one another and take the wife in and talk to her privately. I will never do that. I don't have bad intentions, but I want to keep myself pure and above reproach. We need to be careful. When I was at Langs, there was a lady that wanted a, uh, she wanted a ride to town. Her husband was working that day, and she was a woman a little bit older than I was at the time, and I was in my mid to late 20s, and I said, I'm not taking you to town. She said, why not? And I said, it's not a good idea. Well, she scoffed at that idea. I believe to this day I was right. Because I did not, I wanted to be above reproach, and I did not want to put myself in a bad situation. And then finally, one I want to reference is the one that's listed as 18. Qualification for one who preaches the gospel to follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11. I think the bell rung, it's my time to quit, so I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> stop there. I think that was a phone, but anyway. I appreciate your good attention. And I hope that you'll go back and, and look at this passage and consider these great valuable lessons. The, the church has several things that she can do. One is to minister to the needs of people, but more importantly than that is to support the preaching of the gospel, to take the gospel into the world. And that's what I believe we find here in Acts chapter 6. I appreciate your time.